afternoon. Can everyone hear me? As we start, um, my name is Adam Subera. I'm an analyst at the European Valley uh, Security Center for the Center for Security Policy. Uh, today, I'm here with David Stulik, who's a senior analyst uh, with us, and uh, Piotr Baida, a political science expert. And uh, we will be discussing the possibilities of cooperation between the Warsaw Institute and European Value Center for Security. As uh, pre-selected topics, we have come up with the possibility of mutual cooperation in uh, facing the humanitarian crisis resulting from Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as joint response of, uh, of our countries to increasing Russian aggression within the information and cyberspace and uh, also the EU recovery plan as the new Marshall Plan. Hopefully, if we have time, we can touch topics as the Czech presidency of the EU and the risk of susceptibility to populism in both countries. So uh, I think without further ado, we can uh, proceed with maybe brief introductions of both of the speakers and then on to the debate. So if I can ask maybe Mr. Baida to introduce himself shortly. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, everyone, mm, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be with you and discuss on so hot topic, especially today. And um, um, what I, I, I would like to say in introduction, um, definitely we are in turning point of uh, for the history of, of, um, of the world. But as um, each of the crises, we are able to use it as a challenge and opportunity. And especially, um, we can uh, try to, uh, to make this turning point for um, uh, stronger cooperation between Poland and Czech Republic. Because it's uh, from my perspective and, and on the base of my research um, uh, what i dealing with uh, it's it's some kind of paradox that poland and czech republic is one of the biggest uh, economic partners but it's not equivalent uh, in in political cooperation and i think then <clears throat> especially in the face of russian aggression against ukraine we are able to rebuild this these links and uh, of course starting um, with support for for ukrainian people and on the base of it to, to build for the long term uh, strong links strong cooperation in in many parts and i hope it will be time to discuss it today thank you okay and Thank you. So same thing for David now. Let's just do the introductions and then get into the topics. Right. I'm, I'm very happy that we have this opportunity to discuss the Czech and Polish uh, possible cooperation in the field of foreign policy, especially with regard to the war uh, and Russian aggression against Ukraine. I'm very pleased myself because I spent uh, like 13 years working and studying in Poland. So I always believe that there are many areas for cooperation between two countries, uh, between two other countries. And uh, let me say that uh, recent uh, weeks really brought us closer to each other. Uh, still like more than months ago, uh, the main issue in, on the Czech-Polish agenda was the uh, mine in Turów. And it caused a lot of, I would say, negative emotions on both sides. But uh, now there are also paradoxically good things in these terrible events in Ukraine. That again, we are very much on the uh, the Czech Republic and Poland. And here I would like to refer to that uh, famous uh, train trip of our prime ministers uh, to Kiev. Uh, that is very important symbolically, not only for two countries of us, but also for Ukraine. And I believe that uh, currently uh, there is a lot of uh, synergies and uh, coinciding agendas, interests uh, between our governments. And I'm very much uh, looking with some hopes uh, towards the Thursday NATO summit, uh, where the Czech Republic will definitely support and second the different Polish proposals like the NATO humanitarian peacekeeping mission to Ukraine, uh, the Czech government, as far as I know, is very much supportive of uh, Morawiecki's plan 
uh, that is supposed to help to uh, reconstruct and rebuild Ukraine in the future. So thanks God, uh, we are now on the same boat and we have a, a coinciding interests. And uh, now the, it's a kind of a time to discuss the details where both countries can help with each other because there's one, another common thing and that's the Russian threat. And I think in both countries we are quite uh, concerned about the threat because we know that if Russia is not stopped in Ukraine, our countries, plus Baltic states, are going to face a huge security uh, dilemmas and uh, challenges. So that's where we are, and I will be happy to discuss our further details of, of this cooperation in our talk today. Okay, so I would maybe uh, pick up the ball uh, immediately from the Russian threat, and uh, I think uh, even just not talking about the threat, but the ongoing invasion of Ukraine has already caused a humanitarian crisis, which both of our countries have to face immediately. It's happening right now. So maybe uh, I would ask Mr. Baida, what, would, uh, what do you think is the best way how to cooperate or some of the challenges that are to the mutual cooperation in facing this crisis? Well, I, I think that partly we filled this um, this task to cooperate, especially in the first days of invasion. Uh, it was uh, quite interesting and very good uh, presented in, in Polish media, um, the common uh, decision to give free tickets for Ukrainians um, who use um, uh, train um, from from uh, Ukrainian Polish border to to Czech Republic, etc. So it was uh, it, uh, it it met with very warm comments in Poland. Um, uh, of course, uh, another thing uh, what is already done it's um, some um, uh, quite good communication uh, in the in the border line uh, where uh, it was possible to meet. Uh, Czech people from NGOs and uh, and um, uh, use this opportunity to uh, to um, give a help for for uh, for the newcomers, um, and uh, of course it, it was it was made just um, in the first day of uh, of invasion. Now we have to think how to organize. Um, uh, the life of these people because. Uh, I assume that it will be necessary to be prepared for long-term uh, staying in our countries. And um, uh, from my perspective, one of the best um, uh, best feature um, to, to present the scale of this um, person who uh, is going to decide um, um, to, to, to stay in our countries is, for example, distribution of personal ID numbers. Um, this procedure has been started in Poland um, just a few days ago, and now we have more than 200 people who decide to to receive this number. It means they are uh, uh, they are uh, thinking about staying for uh, for not short time, but um, staying maybe not for permanent um, as a permanent residence. But for a long time um, uh, until the moment when this this conflict um, uh, will be will be solved. So uh, this is this is the the first um, challenge for our government: how to uh, organize the legalization procedure for uh, longer staying. The um, uh, just urgent question and task is to give directly um, especially um, uh, medical service for people who, who whose um, any kind of uh, long-term treatment um, uh, has been um, uh, disturbed in in ukraine such uh, for example as on oncologic part patients and um, especially what is concerned with um, uh, will children win uh, oncology disaster and um, uh, Quite a huge help um, uh, has been uh, provided by um, the German hospitals. 
Um, but of course, it's just just two questions um, uh, and and two examples. Uh, we have we have others like um, education system to be m better prepared for Ukrainian peoples, uh, for whom even alphabet is um, uh, challenging. Um, if um, um, uh, if, if um, they didn't receive an education, for example, in English language as a second language. Uh, and um, I think that um, only one, one, um, one, uh, one, one thing is not uh, difficult for, for us. Uh, it means some kind of uh, cultural barriers there because we, um, we already in Poland um, uh, have met with Ukrainians for a longer time. It's nothing, nothing new, nothing, nothing special to to meet just bigger numbers of of these people. So uh, they they felt in Poland quite safe um, uh, from cultural point of view too. And um, uh, I think that um, on on this cultural base we are we are able to to build some uh, some. Uh, solid uh, base to give them a chance to, to accommodate in this, this new civil services. Okay, thank you for the response. I, I'll give David a chance to uh, reply or have his own take on mutual cooperation in uh, facing this humanitarian crisis. So I will, I will also start where Professor Baida started. Uh, that was the help, uh, we can say, provided by Polish volunteers to Czech volunteers. I myself was involved in uh, coordinating several groups of Czech people going through the border to Medica, Krakowiec, uh, the Ukrainian-Polish border. And uh, whenever we had some issues, we sent it to different uh, groups on Facebook well, we didn't know anybody personally, but we were getting responses in two, three minutes and received a lot of practical advices and support. And it indeed worked very well between the Czech and Polish volunteers in those days. Also, the trains to the Czech Republic were departing from Przemysl. And uh, on the way to Czech Republic, they were also taking people to the stations in, in, in Poland. And in that way, we also helped a bit to kind of... Uh, uh, reveal or release uh, in other words to real situation at the border by taking uh, hundreds of ukrainian citizens further to to poland and uh, this kind of a cooperation between for example the czech railway companies and the polish uh, infrastructure or let's say in charge of uh, railway uh, connections so uh, was quite uh, fa fabulous then uh, the Czech Republic and Poland uh, that faced uh, one of the largest, let's say, waves of uh, refugees, and especially Poland and part of the Republic, uh, was written in a joint, I would say, efforts at the EU level, where both countries were very actively working together with the European Commission and the other member states, but uh, mainly with these countries that come from the, reg are from the region, on the Temporary Protection Directive, that basically granted Ukrainian the basic rights, uh, medical insurance, uh, one year stay visa or permission permits for, for temporary work. This was very well received by Ukrainians, not who were on the leave, but also those who stayed in Ukraine. Uh, it showed a, a real European solidarity with Ukrainians. And again, our countries were among the, say, the pioneers uh, who were promoting uh, the adoption of this directive. Right now, both countries are facing the limits of their system, mainly the social and housing systems. And uh, that's the moment where, again, our countries uh, would need to raise these issues at the EU level and uh, will ask uh, other member states for sharing the burden uh, that we are having on our shoulders. So again, I'll I think uh, our governments will act uh, jointly in negotiating some assistance from Western European countries, member states. So it will be very important to synchronize these efforts, to have a joint messages, to have the same arguments and to uh, lobby for our interests there. 
there is a one more important aspect uh, related to humanitarian situation, and that's the uh, education and schooling, uh, because more than half of the refugees are children, and it is uh, of the utmost importance to keep these children in their education system. So again, I, I know that the Czech Ukrainian diaspora is uh, quite intensively negotiating or consulting their Polish colleagues, the Ukrainian diaspora in Poland, and they are jointly looking for systemic solutions, how to ensure the continuation of education for these kids uh, whenever they stay. So there are, there are a number of initiatives uh, like on, online schooling that, are, that have been developed uh, either in Poland and the Czech Republic, and they are again actively shared by different groups. As far as I know, the Czech uh, Ministry of Education is now trying to develop some guidelines also for uh, primary schools where the Ukrainian kids either join the classes with their Czech uh, uh, fellows, uh, with the Czech uh, pupils, or there are new classes organized just uh, purely for Ukrainian kids. So this is again something that is also very closely coordinated with the Ukrainian Ministry of Education, with the, for example, Ukrainian Embassy here in Prague. So there is a kind of a systemic continuation of this education. So again, I think that both countries, the Czech Republic and Poland, can share that experience with each other. Uh, I don't know the details whether there were any contacts between the officials from both ministries of education, but I believe they are there. Because again, it would be so important that there are no, let's say, 27 EU member states uh, systems uh, for Ukrainian kids, but there is one kind of a uniform systemic solution found for all Ukrainian kids whenever they stay in the EU. And again, our country is kind of, a, let's say, leaders or pioneers because the, the first wave of these refugees uh, uh, stayed in our country. So again, we can work together developing these pilot goals or these pilot schemes also in the education. The last thing is the employment. Uh, both the Czech Republic and Poland were quite dependent on the migrants' work, migrants, uh, work especially the labor migrants from Ukraine. Uh, here in the Czech Republic we face a problem that uh, there are now mainly ladies coming to the Czech Republic uh, and the issue is that uh, they can't perform all different types of work, mainly the manual work, which was previously lifted by men. And quite many Ukrainian men, several thousand, maybe even dozens of thousands from the Czech Republic left. Back, they left back home because uh, they joined the Ukrainian army to fight. So we see here a kind of a discrepancy between those people who come to our country, uh, ladies, who can't perform the work that has been done earlier, previously, by Ukrainian men. So it's a kind of a challenge for the Czech kids. Uh, and I, again, believe here we have a very similar, I don't know, issues, concerns, and problems uh, in the Czech Republic and in Poland. And again, exchanging this experience would uh, help a lot uh, in exchanging the way how, you know, certain new job opportunities are being created uh, for the new refugees this is the kind of a way that we should explore. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, you both highlighted uh, securing housing, securing work opportunities, access to services and uh, overcoming some cultural barriers as uh, maybe the primary uh, areas of concern at the moment. So I would again start with Professor Baida. What are uh, maybe your opinions, how European Values Center and the Warsaw Institute can uh, help concretely or specifically? Well, uh, first, let me add something what was uh, mentioned in the, in the previous section, because uh, it's, um, uh, Mr. Mr. S um, Sto Storik is uh, perfect right that, um, uh, that the, um, uh, our, um, our employment sector is, is changing dramatically. Um, in our cases, uh, main, uh, the, the most um, uh, suffering is, for example, const uh, constructive um, uh, sector. Uh, but um, uh, it's also some kind of uh, challenge for us uh, and the opportunity 
to um, uh, to fill gap in another ones. It means uh, just one example. Uh, today um, has been launched the special um, uh, two weeks program of uh, um, of teaching of Polish medical uh, uh, medical language um, to more than um, uh, four thousand um, uh, um, medical doctors and and um, uh, medical staff uh, from Ukraine just to give them a chance to to be part of this. Uh, of this um, uh, to to feed this this, this um, uh, Polish medical service as soon as possible. So um, I think that um, uh, we can we can see this this group of newcomers as an opportunity to find good teacher, maybe even um, good academic scholars, um, active person, etc. And of course, uh, it's a day de decision, but I think that um, we are able to have some kind of added value and um, um, just uh, just incorporating the, the, this person to, to um, our employee employee system and um, what is concerned with uh, our opportunity as um, as uh, um, to think tanks um, from Poland and Czech Republic and um, uh, first of all um, uh, we are able uh, um, one statement I'm not um, um, Mem uh, employee member of of the uh, Warsaw Institute. I'm just um, uh, collaborate with with them from time to time, and uh, it's it's from my opinion very very interesting and and important think tank uh, on on uh, on the Polish uh, NGOs market. Um, uh, and I see I think that um, uh, the first uh, first of all. Uh, our both think tank um, uh, should be um, uh, should should play um, uh, the role of good advisor for our governments uh, to promote Polish Czech cooperation on political level. Um, uh, and of course, is quite general task. What is concerned with with um, uh, uh, Russian invasion against against Ukraine? We are able to use our contact, our possibilities to uh, to, to to award, especially our Western partner, uh, what this um, uh, what this means not only from the eastern flank of, of NATO, but for the rest of um, of Europe, for the future of of um, uh, our European community, and um, uh, th this is the second um, um, th this is the second huge goal. And some more um, tactical ones. Um, uh, I think that we are able to, uh, um, uh, we are ready uh, and able to, to to launch some kind of permanent cooperation, um, especially in the field of um, of um, um, uh, fight with this information. Because this is something what we we face today, and it will be problem much bigger with each of the day of, of this invasion, because it's not only uh, not only um, uh, um, war felt in in the in the Ukraine, but also in the cyberspace, and um, it, uh, I think that that uh, as much as possible NGOs, think tanks, uh, and, uh, acad universities will be involved in such kind of activity. Um, and if it will be done together, we will be able to, 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 to win. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm glad that you brought up the um, topic of information warfare and uh, countering Russian propaganda. and. Uh, Currently, there's the debate going on all around Europe about censoring, you know, disinformation amplifier or completely or completely cutting them down uh, as the entire domain. So maybe I'll ask David if there's a if he has a preference or what is what do you think is the better solution, whether Russian propaganda censorship or maybe preference of the domestic narrative, if you know what I mean. Right. I have a lot of experience with that because I used to work as a EU spokesperson in Ukraine. And uh, I remember those days back in 2014 and 15 when Ukrainian authorities were 
banning Russian TV channels, then they were closing down the access to Russian social media. And uh, I remember the European reactions to that, uh, when we were calling on Ukraine to kind of uh, refrain from censoring Russian media. And uh, those of us who worked in Ukraine, were, we were perfectly aware that uh, this was not about uh, the issue of, this was not an issue of censoring these outlets or these, well, media, we call them in that way. It was really about national security. Because in the Russian understanding, these uh, so-called media outlets were just another means of a warfare, right? That's why they like information weapons. Uh, it, 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 it is, nowadays, I would like to see any, let's say, European expert calling uh, Mr. Solovyov or Kisilev or Ms. Skabeva as, as a journalist. No, they are information soldiers. Let's face it. These are a part of the Russian warfare. These are elements of their hybrid operations. So that's why the, let's say, normal, usual uh, rights or uh, freedoms that media enjoy in democratic countries, they cannot be extended to them. Because if we are offering them these freedoms, accept them as, as a media, as, as journalists, we are granting them the right to abuse these freedoms. And they do it. So it's not about, it's not the issue of censoring this media. It is the issue of the protection of national security. And these outlets are threatening our securities, security, national security. So we have to tackle it in a, again, in a legal way. Uh, promoting national or positive narratives. This is also good, but it's not a part of the, I mean, it's not the solution. It's a part of the solution. You have to convince your own societies about your arguments. You have to explain it to your fellow citizens why suddenly the Czech Republic is sending weapons to Ukraine. Uh, you have to communicate it to your citizens, to your taxpayers, to your voters. Uh, but it's not enough. Uh, this is, again, just one of the, let's say, have to our disposal to take this uh, Russian hybrid uh, uh, threat, uh, this information threat, this information propaganda, fake news. Uh, so that's uh, kind of um, an issue that needs to be tackled in a more complex way. And again, uh, my argument is that it's not only Ukraine who is in the war right now. It is also us, the West, uh, the EU, the NATO, that we are in the war. And during the war, you have to use a little bit more, I would say, tougher or some might call it a more radical means, but this is uh, all done, it all needs to be done in order to protect our national security. Thank you, David. Mr. Professor, do you have anything to add to the censorship or uh, that, that uh, level of argument? Yeah, uh, well, I agree in 100% with, with uh, Mr. Stolik and I think, uh, uh, and and I would like to, to underline uh, one more thing that, uh, in fact, uh, we are not uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, zero point. Uh, we have some kind of experience already, uh, already in our hands. And, and maybe this is, especially in the face of, of Russian aggression against, against Ukraine, now we are able to, to uh, count our efforts, to, to exchange our, our experiences. For example, from from uh, my Polish perspective, it's it's um, it was very interesting to to, to study what is uh, what is doing Narodny Urzad pro Kibernetyczko a Informacją Bezpieczną or Centrum Pro Terrorizmu za Hybrydne Chrosby, uh, uh, because it, it's some kind um, of uh, model activity. What is not implemented in such kind of way in Poland, um, uh, but uh, from from uh, uh, Poli side, we have some kind of good solution. Um, uh, what is uh, what is concerned with um, with cryptological um, uh, tools and um, uh, experience in 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 um, let's say uh, uh, ethic uh, hacking. And um, this is something what could be some good good place to meet and to 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 exchange our experiences and. Um, 
in, in my my dream is is to establish some kind of center of excellence for Polish Czech, maybe maybe uh, in cooperation with, with Slovaks to um, uh, to to to, to uh, identify this this uh, direction of Russian narrative and propaganda. Um, because um, uh, what is um, uh, what, what what was observed by myself a few years ago that Russian um, 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 has done quite a, a good job to identify what is um, uh, what is um, our uh, weakness um, uh, on on national level different in each of our states so for example it was um, it was quite obvious that uh, the russian poland um, promoted uh, uh, some kind of solidarity of slavs um, uh, promoted uh, um, uh, press slavs uh, mythology as as uh, some common ground for for um, uh, for build links with with poets and uh, for example a few years ago um, i met with a conference organized in in prague by pro russian um, uh, pro russian um, uh, groups uh, called um, russophobia uh, um, as antisemitism of uh, 21st century so uh, to identify such, such kind of factors and use in each of our countries could be useful to, to be able to identify this this um, uh, Russian uh, propaganda channels and and um, groups. Okay, that was yeah, both very interesting. Uh, I'm uh, I'm maybe got a get a little idea because we're talking strictly about the information space right now. But I remember a few months or maybe already a year. Time flies. But uh, Czech Republic was, uh, and I think both Poland, the entire European Union at one point has to go through this transformation, and that's the 5G infrastructure. So is there a possibility of a joint response or some sort of a joint defense mechanism uh, on a state level with both countries? Because, for instance, the Czech Republic, we, uh, we disallowed Huawei and uh, companies uh, from uh, dictator regimes to build that infrastructure due to data security and uh, i think it's uh, it's one of the key questions um, for cybersecurity in the future because the company who is building these infrastructures will de facto control uh, control the information space so maybe david Yeah, Professor uh, Baida already mentioned our agency for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. NUKIP, uh, and it's a kind of a unique uh, structural organization, uh, even for other new or NATO member states. And I don't know whether you have a similar body or public agency in Poland, but it is exactly this agency that is issuing decisions on the use of uh, the Chinese-made uh, technologies in 5G infrastructure. It is this agency that is influencing the official public policy in our country on how to deal with these, uh, let's say, uh, gaps or possible gaps or possible involvement of, of, of Chinese state companies or Chinese semi-private companies in uh, building uh, this critical telecommunication infrastructure. So I think, uh, at least in the Czech Republic, I would say we are relatively well protected uh, from these threats. Uh, so two years ago, there was a big uh, 5G Prague conference that adopted a set of recommendations how to tackle uh, the uh, participation of Chinese companies in public tenders for 5G infrastructure. And again, this is something that uh, originated here in Prague and other countries, including Poland, uh, kind of sign up uh, to these principles and to these recommendations. So again, there is a lot of things that uh, could and should be shared uh, with, with both countries. But also we have to keep in mind that uh, the uh, Central European headquarters for companies like Huawei are based in Poland. And we know that the Polish authorities uh, have had uh, several, let's say, uh, uh, accidents with uh, people working for uh, these uh, Chinese uh, technological giants that they were kind of spying uh, just for the benefit of China. So I think here Poland is more, I would say, exposed 
to such a threat uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, Poland is hosting the headquarters of these companies. So this is something that uh, definitely the agencies uh, in Poland should closely look at, and I'm quite sure they are doing that, because sometimes we are receiving uh, emails from uh, Stanislav Żarin, who is a special spokesperson of the government for these issues, and uh, occasionally he is sending us the messages about these cases. So it is, I think, also dealt in Poland. But I'm, I'm again, I don't know the details here, whether it's done in a, such a systemic way like here in the Czech Republic, where we have the National uh, Security Agency for, I mean, we have a national agency for uh, cyber security. So this is another area where we could easily, you know, uh, share the experience and uh, also use our best practices models so that Poland can follow the track. But again, as I said, I'm not so familiar with the details how these things are being organized or are being dealt with in Poland. Thank you. So I would maybe ask Mr. Professor Baida to give us a little bit of the Polish insight on this topic. Um, I'm afraid I, I, I will be not the best person because I'm not expert in uh, 5G infrastructure. But um, it's true that um, a few years ago, um, two persons was arrested, uh, one of them from the top of management of Huawei uh, branch um, office in, in, in Warsaw. Uh, fortunately, there was no um, uh, discussion or, or any kind of, of voice to protect China company involvement in, in um, this, this infra infrastructure. Um, uh, um, building of this infrastructure of uh, 5G, um, um, except some kind of far right uh, uh, party uh, presented now in 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 in, uh, in Polish Parliament, uh, like SPD in 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 Czech Republic. It, it was quite the same profile um, of the uh, of the political activity. So um, I think that um, uh, um, one. Other thing what uh, what uh, uh, um, support our decision to exclude China companies to build our 5G infrastructure, it was quite strong um, tie with um, uh, United States and um, cooperation. I think not only on the base of uh, of uh, official institutions, but I hope also on, on the base of Secret Service. Um, which uh, give our government enough evidence uh, not to give a chance China to to, um, to uh, um, expand its activity in Poland. Okay, uh, thank you. We're uh, in the second part of the discussion now, and uh, with about twenty minutes left, I'm going to maybe shift a little bit, and I wanted to talk about the EU recovery plan as the new Marshall Plan and how it can address the social and economic fallout of both the, uh, the, well, the COVID pandemic crisis, which is now highlighted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So David, could you please start? And again, uh, this is an area where uh, the Czech political elites are wholeheartedly supporting the Polish initiative that is uh, led and, and was presented by Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki. Uh, there are even thoughts to call it, uh, uh, label it as Morawiecki's plan, right? Because some people are referring to it uh, Marshall Plan 2. And uh, indeed, it's already time to think about uh, inviting different uh, international organizations, international institutions, IFIs, uh, including uh, the European institutions like European Investment Bank and EBRD including uh, inviting some you know, member states and as well as the other countries uh, from the, let's say, Western, Western uh, world uh, to pledge, to make pledges uh, for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, because, uh, again, paradoxically, this could be a, a, a part of the uh, fast track solution of many problems in Ukraine. It is always easier to start building certain things, uh, invest things uh, when you have a brownfield, right? So paradoxically, Ukraine might not be so dependent in the future on heavy industry, on coal mines, especially in eastern Ukraine. So it's a right time 
now to think about uh, developing and investing into new uh, economic sectors uh, that are related to IT, that are related to nanotechnologies, that are related to green economy. So it's a, it's a, it's an occasion now to speed up the economic and social development of Ukraine when the war is over. And I think uh, it's again very much appreciated also in Ukraine that this initiative comes from Poland, from a country that is a neighbor, a, a big and important advocate of Ukraine. So I know that we, I know that we are going to discuss it a little bit for later on. Uh, it will be a, one of the priorities of the Czech EU presidency that starts on the 1st July uh, this year. So that renovation, uh, investment into Ukraine economy, infrastructure will be very much high on agenda. And again, we have, a, I would say, a lot of uh, unfortunate ex experience, a track record, for example, from, uh, from Yugoslavia. So we can learn a lot from these kind of cases and uh, be well prepared when this uh, right moment, when the war is over and war will be over when Russia is defeated. So then uh, the whole, let's say, Western democratic world will help Ukraine to develop a strong uh, and functional, efficient economy. And I believe that uh, there is a chance to do that reconstruction pretty fast. So then we might all benefit from these economic growth in Ukraine, and especially the neighboring countries. We would be able to benefit from participation of our com companies in the tendering procedures, uh, from the increased opportunities for trade, mutual trade. So there might be a more, let's say, organic links between different companies established uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of, the, of this uh, big plan for reconstruction of Ukraine. So, Let's see it as an opportunity. And it is also very important for Ukrainian people to see that there are countries that think about their future. It is also a moral boost to present it inside Ukraine, that we are trying to help them to rebuild their country. This is something that would be very much appreciated when the fighting stops. Okay, thank you. That's a few words from Professor Baida on the EU recovery plan. Uh, if I can uh, conclude in, in few few words, of course I agree with uh, with David Sturik, um, uh, and it's it's true that rebuilding of Ukraine could be used for huge modernization of this country, and um, this this is. Uh, the the biggest opportunity for Ukrainian how to um, change this dramatic situation in, in into um, uh, position of the winner in this in this modernization process because um, there is uh, there is the chance for Ukraine to be much more modernized country in Russia what would what could be uh, the one of the biggest um, uh, biggest loss of of uh, moscow in in such conflict um, but um, i have uh, one doubt uh, and um, whole discussion on uh, the eu recovery plan and um, it's it's a quite tough subject for me because um, uh, um, there is a lot of discussion in poland uh, what is uh, 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 what kind of intention is in uh, European Union institutions? Poland has uh, has been waiting for the approval of the recovery plan for um, for several months, and uh, I would like to 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 to, uh, to mention that it was some kind of a written agreement, what was broken that the rule of law mechanism would be activated uh, in the event of uh, uh, event of threat of fraudulent funds. And it's difficult to say that Poland is, is a country exposed uh, to corruption. And um, this is, um, uh, if po Poland um, uh, have to be um, uh, involved in this process of using of European, uh, European plan, uh, European fund um, to, to rebuild Ukraine, um, first, uh, first of all, we have to uh, to, to to finish our um, 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 our conflict with uh, um, Brussels, and it's not only task for 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 Warsaw government. 
and I think that that without it, uh, it could be quite difficult for for us to to use our own sources. What what is done now, especially to to um, uh, um, uh, to support Ukrainian refugees, um, because it looks like that um, it's not a question of of um, rule of law, but is a question of. Uh, uh, dislike, even dislike of, of uh, this government, and um, it is something what is what is uh, um, discussed in Poland, um, especially in in the face of this uh, refugees wave. Thanks. Thank you. That was very very uh, enriching. And uh, we're shortly running out of time, and I have one one topic uh, that sort of stems out of all the things that are uh, that that we spoke about today. And um, one similarity between both countries in the recent history, we uh, both our communities or our societies have been susceptible to populism. And uh, I wanted to ask about your opinions because in the last two years of pandemic. And now with the invasion of Ukraine, these are two extreme situations to already, uh, I think, traumatize society. What do you think is going to, um, how this tendency for both societies to, um, to be at risk, you know, from populist or susceptible to populism, how it will develop? So maybe David again. I think that uh, the longer this uh, war in Ukraine is lasting, the more chances there will be for Czech populists being south of the political uh, because uh, you know xenophobic opposition is already trying to use the uh, refugees crisis for their own political purposes. And uh, their main message now is that if there was no Ukraine, we wouldn't have these problems and our people would have a better life. Well, there will be no hikes of the prices of oil and electricity and so on and so forth. Uh, they often use the example of uh, Viktor Orban, who was able to secure a cheap gas deal with Russia. Of course, they don't mention at what price. So there might be uh, more opportunities for these people, for these populists. To exploit the current situation because uh, the, the longer the conflict lasts the more uh, impact it would have on world and global economy not only energy uh, sector but also an agricultural sector uh, foodstuff sector uh, there might there is a huge risk that the world will face a kind of a global uh, crisis uh, on the uh, foodstuff market the prices will definitely go up. So there will be another kind of a wave of inflation to the economies, uh, in the economies that are, as you said, reviving from uh, COVID-19. So people are quite tired. And if, uh, again, they are facing new challenges, uh, high surprises, uh, they would see that the refugees are gonna stay here longer than uh, people were expecting. So definitely this would be abused and misused by political populists and demagogues. Uh, because also the patience of the, let's say, regular citizens is, uh, is not uh, unlimited. And uh, that's a kind of an issue, at least here in the Czech Republic, that even part of the democratic opposition might be tempted to use uh, these uh, developments for their own political battles. Again, the pro we live in democratic societies, which is great, but uh, the major objective of all politicians is to be reelected or to be elected uh, after four years uh, in a four year cycle. So they will be tempted to use all the, the hardship that is also fallen on the heads of our citizens for their own benefits. So I'm, I'm still quite uh, happy that we are not at that stage that uh, these arguments of uh, Czech populists are not uh, affecting the most of the people but uh, over the time, they will definitely will be getting more weight and unfortunately more influence. Thank you, Professor Baida. Uh, 
Well, I think that, that Poland is in uh, a little uh, better situation because um, uh, what is uh, what is concerned with uh, Polish political sense, this populist movement is not used uh, in so huge um, uh, uh, form like uh, I, I am able to observe in Czech Republic. Uh, so it means that even in the uh, uh, in the Polish Parliament, this uh, this um, uh, par uh, this party, this this political movement, um, uh, which to, to um, use as a tool in this populist is quite marginal. Uh, it's not in the in the core of the political sense. Of course, we are able to observe another thing because uh, I agree that uh, that uh, populist uh, will be key. Um, a key challenge for us in future, uh, in near future, because of this, uh, what was mentioned of the of the uh, of the um, rising of the of the prices for for um, uh, basic products. Um, uh, there's this uh, possible uh, crisis on the on the food stuff market, etc. But um, I um, I think that uh, and and of course we need to add this new group. Uh, uh, of of um, uh, people of citizens involved in a new anti-Ukrainian campaign. Uh, what is quite obvious on on the Polish Polish market um, that uh, it's the same uh, the same groups, the same social accounts who used um, uh, argument against vaccination, uh, against fighting with with uh, COVID-19, etc. It's almost one-to-one -one, uh, copy and, and transform in, 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 in just a few last days. So um, this, is, this is the challenge, especially in, in distribution of information uh, among young people, because especially young generation is not interested in traditional channel, uh, channels for, for distribution of information, uh, they they are almost uh, spending no time with TV or, or radio or something like that, just internet, it's all this, this, this world, and this is the, the, the main place to distribute this, this, this information. And um, it is um, it, it could be danger uh, in in uh, uh, future uh, future perspective, and um, uh, I think that that um, it is why it's it's um, also some kind of challenge for us and how to prepare good and uh, even education people to um, uh, to to to, uh, to check this information. Fortunately, we have a few very interesting project loved by NGOs interested in, in um, 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 cybersecurity. So um, it's, a, it's a chance that um, we'll be able to, to fight with this, this procedure. Thanks. Okay, thank you both for, uh, for your wonderful answers. We still have a few minutes left and uh, we haven't touched the topic or David touched it briefly of the opportunity of Czech Republic as a um, or Czech presidency in the European Union. So if you would both just give us maybe some brief ideas about that. And if you have any last remarks you want to make, then now's your chance. So David, would you please start? Yeah. I, again, we are in a very, I would say, uh, unique moment that uh, by coincidence, after 10 years, the Czech presidency uh, is taking place in these kind of crucial in these crucial times when we have to reconsider the whole, uh, I know, idea and the structure of internal organization of the EU, how the institutions are going to function in the future. We are about to reconsider our enlargement policy, and uh, the good thing is that we will have this. <laughs> rotating presidency right now, exactly in this moment. And I know that uh, our colleagues, friends uh, at the MFA in the government are also very seriously considering this opportunity for promoting uh, the European future, European perspective of Ukraine. And this is something that, again, both of our countries have in common. 
And uh, I found it also great that this uh, presidency is going to take place with the new government here in the Czech Republic. So it's not the government that would be like the previous one, dependent on pro-Russian President Zeman, uh, which would decrease uh, the ambitions of, of our presidency. So right now I know that uh, one, of the pro the, one of the priorities will be Ukraine. And uh, it, will, it will be uh, our objective to provide Ukraine with candidate status during the Czech presidency. If this is happening, then it will be indeed a historic event. It will be a kind of an anchor for Ukraine to stay organically connected to the EU. And uh, hopefully that the following negotiations that will be opened and launched after granting the status would eventually lead to the membership of Ukraine in the EU. But again, I, as I said, we have to rather significantly reconsider the whole architecture of the EU because Ukraine is a huge country. Uh, we'll have to reconsider all different decision-making uh, mechanisms within the EU. Uh, and again, this is something that uh, needs to be done. And uh, we, the Czech Republic, will have the opportunity to be a mediator of these discussions. And uh, since, uh, unlike Poland, we are not a direct neighbor, uh, I would say we are even better situated than Poland uh, to be this kind of an uh, interlocutor, mediator of these uh, negotiations. Also, we, as a small country uh, that, does, didn't, that hasn't had a uh, historical, let's say, uh, interests in Eastern Europe, like Poland has had, uh, is also a kind of our advantage. And this is something that also Polish diplomacy or Polish uh, government uh, could use because we can't be abused uh, of promoting our own geopolitical interest in, in that part of uh, Europe. So again, we see here a wonderful uh, synergy uh, between what uh, Polish uh, diplomacy and Polish uh, government has been doing for many years. And we saw here a kind of uninterrupted continuation of this policy towards Eastern Europe uh, since uh, 1989 in uh, Polish history. Uh, and this is something that where, again, the Czechs can be the advocates, not only of Ukraine, but also of Poland. Uh, so I see here a wonderful historical opportunity that uh, we will be ha able to promote uh, this, these historical decisions in the second half of this year. So again, it's a kind of blessing to us that we will have this uh, presidency uh, in that in such an important time. Blessing in disguise. Okay, uh, thank you, David. And last remarks from uh, Professor Baida. Well, I I like very much what uh, what David said. Um, uh, it, definitely, we we need a strong European Union. Um, um, especially in this in this moment when we face with so so huge trade from from the east and only strong union uh, could be able to build strong ukraine i'm afraid that um, it will be impossible to to to, to build strong uh, european union without a uh, strong presence uh, uh, a strong polish presence um, uh, within the eu structure it is why i hope that this this czech presidency Will be used um, um, and uh, will be used as as a moderating of this uh, this uh, dispute between Poland and Brussels, and I think that Prague can uh, Prague can play such kind of role of wise um, uh, moderated also also in, in this world. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, uh, both guests, for attending this discussion. And thank you, Voice Institute and uh, European Values for putting it together. <laughs> and uh, thank you for anyone who was watching for uh, for watching and for your attention. Okay, bye bye.